All right, in this video, uh, I'm gonna go over some emissive stuff as well as some like panel and height information, um, just so you guys can get some ideas of how to improve like adding details to some of your, like if you're doing mechanical or, you know, carved shapes like this, and especially when you're working with emissives, how you can make those look a little bit better. So here's my setup right here. I just have these different um, objects that I kind of made. Um, this is all, you know, material based, right? So if I hide this, and I think this other one should be on the body. Uh, if I come over to the body for the button, right? This is the button, right? It's just all inside there. And actually, I need to clean up this area a little bit better. Um, but that's all just, this is all just um, uh, emissive and um, height information, displacement information. So I'm gonna go through this, uh, most of these one step at a time. I'm gonna go ahead and start with this one right here. So I'm gonna come over to uh, let's go ahead and close that. Um, and then I also have this one, which I need a name, which is like LED sign. Okay, let's we'll hide that one. All right, so we're gonna start with this triangle symbol because that's kind of like the first one I made and it's a little bit of, it's kind of the simplest setup. So um, I started here, let's go ahead and build these up one at a time or talk through them one at a time. So I have first this anchor point layer, right? So this anchor point layer, if I alt click on it, it essentially just has a um, fill node with the shape that I pulled from here, and then it has an anchor point. So this is just a paint layer. It has no information on it. Um, I didn't paint anything on it. I just clicked on this button here to create a paint layer because I'm just using this for referencing uh, a shape. I personally like to do this workflow where I make uh, like my pattern or my painting or my drawing in, uh, in the mask of a paint layer. So like I have this paint layer and I made this mask and then I anchor point it. Um, and then I do height in a separate layer and then I do my other material um, effects in another layer. So I usually have a height layer and then like a materials layer. Um, and so what I'm doing here is, and an anchor point layer. So I make this pattern, add an anchor point. Then here for this um, uh, height channel, I just created a height fill layer. So fill layer brought height, just pulled it down a little bit like that. And then I went ahead and um, come in here. I just went ahead and grabbed the um, the anchor. So I've created a new fill node and I'm referencing that anchor down there of my pattern. And then I beveled it, right? Because if I don't do that, you'll see it's, it's just straight up and down. But when I add that bevel, I get like this kind of linear fall off, which is kind of nice, which is different than if I um, blurred it, right? Like if I went here and blurred it, right? That would give me like a soft fall off. Um, bevel is going to give me a harder shape fall off. Um, and then, of course, I'm going to um, reference this as well, right? Because I'm going to reference this and use this in some other areas. So really quickly, I'm going to come over here and show you guys, just remind you guys that I'm using displacement in Substance Painter just so I can see the effect, right? Like you can see with this this um, this button down here, by having that um, displacement turned on, this makes it a really um, a little bit more believable. You can see it still looks pretty good here, but um, that, that depth doesn't feel quite right sometimes. So I usually like to preview, but I'm also on a computer that's pretty strong. So if you can't do that, it might slow down your laptop or something like that. So just keep in mind um, that consideration. All right, so then what I'm doing is um, I have this layer right here. This is another anchor point layer, and this is to make adjustments to um, my original or uh, this anchor point. So I'm taking this pattern right here and I'm making some adjustments and making a new anchor. So I have quite a few anchors and that's something that I'm doing a lot of a lot of the time. Um, it's important that you guys get used to if you're still kind of avoiding or you're not quite sure understanding how anchor points work, please, please, please try watching videos on them and testing them out and playing around with them. Like they are so powerful, they are so useful. And by avoiding them because they're confusing, you guys are missing out on a huge amount of control you can get in Substance Painter. So um, what I'm doing here is if we come out here, um, the next step I kind of made, this is just for fun. You guys don't have to do this. You can skip ahead if this is a little too outside scope. Um, it's not super important, but I was doing some of this like kind of cracking, chipping stuff because I wanted to feel like carved ruins or something like that. Um, speaking of which, I should probably come over here and honestly, I should add a filter warp node. Let's do a warp node because this is kind of a little too perfect. So we'll add a warp and by default, that's going to be way too much. So I'm just going to bring that intensity down and I would also make this source tiling a little bit larger so that it's a really big effect. So like it kind of wobbles the whole thing a bit. 
So you can see I'm starting to wobble it too much, but if I wanted to make that a little bit less perfect, that's something I could do. But anyways, okay. So anyways, coming back up to here. So um, I have this crack. That one's just literally just painted and I'm just um, turning into height information. Um, so we'll ignore that one for now. Um, for this chip one, I'm, I am referencing the shape, right? Because I want to chip those edges a little bit. Um, so what I'm doing is this is just another height channel, right? I'm just subtracting height. And let's go ahead and look at our height blending modes. Okay. So on this one, though, I'm referencing a anchor point from this layer. So under this layer, because I'm trying to uh, reference the edges and also chip them, we'll come through here. So we'll build this up slowly over time. So down here, I have my, I'm bringing in this um, beveled anchor into this fill layer, into this new mask. Um, I'm using levels to kind of flatten it out to these edges, right? So push this all the way to the edge, because what I want to do is I want to do a high pass. And so this high pass filter is essentially just going to do an edge detection. I probably could have done instead of that um, mask um, border. So you can do mask outline or sorry, mask outline kind of does the same thing. Um, but it's just going to detect those edges and highlight them. And then I set an anchor point here. And then I use levels to kind of crash this down. So I'm just uh, using um, levels to clamp the values. So I'm getting just a black and white image. And then I'm going to head and use a blur slope filter. So that blur slope filter is just does this kind of like chipping effect. And so if we come out here, you can see it kind of chips away at the edges, which is great. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. But the problem is you can see this is also cutting into my main pattern, right? Oh, not this one, right here. It's currently just e eating away into those edges as well, right? Because I, if I look at this, those white lines are pushing into the surface. I just want the chipped parts. So this is a little messy, but what I ended up doing was I just went ahead and grabbed that high pass fill, uh, anchor and I subtracted it from this image. So all the chipped stuff kind of spread away from that original mask and it's left behind. And I'm just subtracting out the um, high pass stuff. So if I come out here, you can see I just erased um, the original pattern away from there so I'm just left with the chip stuff so this might be a little too like I mean this is a very complicated setup not as in like wow so complicated but more as in like it's it's pretty convoluted um, but uh, I just wanted to show that and then I was also I don't even know if I oh right I added an anchor point because um, again this is just an empty paint layer and I'm just using it for creating anchor points and patterns and then up here under chip height I'm just bringing that anchor point in and just using that height right and so I'm just dialing that height down a little bit to chip it. And then I'm just, you know, roughing it up and I can change the color um, and the material, but you know, a little less important, but let's go ahead and ignore this for the rest of the time. Okay, we'll ignore the fun crack. I'll just add it in um, just cause I like it. Um, so here we're gonna do our emissiveness. So um, what I had to make sure to do is go to my texture set settings and turn on emissive, right? I have to add that anchor or that um, material property. So I'm just going to add emissive. It's not in this list because it's already out here. And then all my fill layers now will have an emissive component to them. So on these, I'm just making sure these layers are just emissive and I'm setting a color. And uh, I'll show you, I'm breaking it into two different layers, right? Because I like to kind of do this effect where I have a, um, like a broader color layer and then I have a hotter center core layer that's like a little bit closer to white right and we can go to the emissive channels to see how those blend together right so this this one's just normal and this one's linear dodge add just to add it's going to increase the other one more or less but you know it's getting kind of clamped by the color max that it can do and substance or in render man when you bring into render man you can like crank values past one but in here we can't really do that with these because they're being clamped uh, but anyways let's talk about what i'm doing here so um let's take a look at this one right here right so um this one right here i'm just essentially taking my um uh triangle bevel right so we're gonna uh, or sorry my tri triangle beveled shape so it's this one right here um and i'm essentially uh, adjusting it to grab the inner part, right? So if I come out here, you can see when I turn that emissive on, it's like kind of glowing the edges too, which is kind of weird. Like it feels like I want this to be like almost like a hot, sh this shape right here in the groove, the, the inside is to be like the part that's emitting the magic light. I don't want the edges to, I want the edges to be like stale stay stone. So what I'm doing is I'm just using the levels adjustment on this fill layer right here. 
and I'm just kind of clamping that down, bringing that down in here. And I might blur it a little bit just to kind of lose that, just let a little bit of spillage. And then what I did is I added a warp just to make it a little bit more magical, right? Because I didn't want it to be perfect, like it's it's machine-like. This one I kind of want it to be a little bit more like magic. Um, and then I'm kind of doing the same thing with this hot glow, right? On this hot glow, what I'm doing is I'm just, again, grabbing that beveled shape and um, tightening it in. I go ahead and blur and levels it again, which is just going to tighten it down even further, right? So if I do blur and then use the levels and just shift that middle value, I can shrink it in even more. And then I, again, I warp it a little bit. And then uh, in this case, I added a little bit of a texture in here. So I just added like Gaussian spots, right? Again, that warp just makes it a little irregular, right? Um, this blur and levels node just kind of brought it in. So there's like a fall off, there's like a hotter core and then spread out. Um, and then Gaussian spots just adds that texture. So that's the basic rundown of how I do the emissiveness, right? Um, so I just did two different layers on that one. So let's go ahead and move on to, let's look at this pattern on the back. So on the back of the head, I created this kind of, someone had like this Zelda pattern. So I went ahead and added this in. It's a little fuzzy and I probably would make, keep making adjustments to it, but I didn't want it to take that long. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and walk through this one. Uh, let's close that group, there we go. All right, so I'm gonna come down here. Uh, so uh, first thing I was doing was I was making, uh, we'll start with some raised diocese. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide the pattern stuff. Um, so let's go ahead and do the, let's just do these one at a time. All right, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to have that pattern, right? So we have this pattern right here. Oh, actually, let me get that pattern it's somewhere else. Um, this is the circle. Okay, so we have, I don't know why this is called circle. It should be called pattern, not pattern. Pattern, anchor, layer. And this is circle, anchor, layer. All right, so this pattern, anchor, layer, what I did was um, uh, I, loaded in this um, design pattern. Someone uploaded these scanned patterns from Breath of the Wild. Um, and so what I did was I just essentially brought that pattern in. But right now, it's kind of hard to see, but the pattern is actually just a black PNG image. There is no white backing to it. So first what I did was I added a fill layer in here and made it white, and then I loaded in that pattern. So it's black over white now. Um, so I just had to make that adjustment in Subspinner. I could have done it in Photoshop, but it was just black over nothing. So it wasn't something I could use as a mask. And of course, I make an anchor point so I can reference this later. And then I wanted this to have like a raised dais, right? And I wanted it to be contained to a circle. So I just made uh, essentially, again, I did a fill shape. And it's kind of hard to see, but um, there is sometimes uh, when you bring in these shapes. So I brought in a shape from over here. Let's do shape. If you look at um, here, okay, sorry, shapes. So there's all these cool shapes you can use in it and they kind of give you these really basic shapes. So I just used um, the base default shape right here and just put it in a fill node um, and I can play with that hardness. But um, uh, sometimes you have to add in a fill node because um, uh, you know it won't have a background, especially if you set this to not repeat, right? So I set it to not repeat. If I said repeat, you know, I would keep getting circles. I only wanted it right here. So I turned that repeat to none. Um, and in this case, I think it's fine, but I put a backing there just in case. So it's just black. And then again, I'm just making an anchor point. All right, let's come out. And so the first thing I did was I did like this raised dais effect, right? So I want it to be kind of like a plaque that comes off. And so on this one, it's just a height channel, right? So, oh, okay, you can see I'm also um, adding in some, I didn't need emissiveness, but I'm also adding in some uh, just overriding the roughness and um, I don't need that metallicness so I just needed height and roughness so I'm just adding increasing that height and so for the mask you can see it looks like this and this one's a little complicated um, but we'll go through it right so what I did is I'm just referencing that circle so again I'm just pulling in that circle um, shape up here into the fill node I'm blurring it so that's going to give me some more values that spread from here to here right so by blurring it you kind of give yourself more grayscale values to work with and then I use the levels node to just kind of expand that further. And then here I use this filter called gradient dynamic. So gradient dynamic is going to use another image and it's going to remap your values across a gradient. So essentially what it does is it takes another image and if you have like a black to white gradient, so here I have like almost like a black to white gradient, it's going to let me turn that into like a pattern for the most part. So you can see when I turn that on, I loaded in, um, uh, what image? Oh, gradient alternate. So you can see gradient 
alternate. So I found these ones right here. So I just loaded this one right here into there. So gradient alternate, and it's that pattern. And uh, then I can play with that tiling, right? And uh, we can play with the balance, right? Or contrast. The contrast probably shouldn't mess around that much with. Um, and then so that gives me something that looks really harsh though, right? That looks a little too sharp. So then what I ended up doing was I just blurred it to get it softened. Um, and then that gave me that shape. So and I was just playing a lot around a lot with this, right? So that blur, including that blur, right? That was helping me scale it up and down. Um, same thing with levels. Like so it's nice to look at your mask, right? But I had to frequently come out here to make adjustments on these nodes um, to kind of understand where things were at. Okay. So then I also, this is what I was talking about before, is I usually have a um, anchor point layer. So I have my circle or dais, I could have called that raised dais anchor point. Then I have the type, and then I also have the material. So in this case, I just did a material so I can make that feel like it's metal. And if I needed to clean it up more, I'd try to get rid of that like stone pattern on it, right? Because that doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but for time's sake, I just kept going. Um, so I just, again, just referenced uh, in this case, I think I referenced this raised dais anchor point here. Um, and if we take a look at this, I just grabbed the same mask I'm using for the height. And what I did is I blurred it, and then I used levels to clamp it, and then I subtracted out the main circle um, and just uh, made that harder. So if we come out here, right, I just grabbed this, this guy's uh, um, anchor point. So I'm just grabbing that same mask, I blurred it, use levels to clamp it so I can get a sharp fall off right here. And then I subtracted out that circle, but you can see it's a little blurry, which doesn't look very realistic. And then I, so I just use the levels to clamp it down. Um, so I had a sharper fall off. And then I, I wanted this to still feel like stone, so I added a stone breakup pattern to it. And again, just use that circle mask. That one's really basic. And then I did my pattern. So on this one, uh, ooh, for some reason that's not working. Um, let me go ahead and fix this really quick. Okay, so I fixed my height. Um, I have these, I get, this gets a little complicated, but um, I was using um, different blending modes to make this work better with the underlying height, right? So they can kind of interact, right? Because I wanted this to not have the stone pattern inside of it because that would just get too muddy. Um, so I had to, instead of doing like linear dodge add, right? Um, oh, then now this is a problem. If I bring this in right to here, right, you can see that that pattern is uh, that um, texture is getting inside there. So I had to do um, uh, darken, take the minimum value. But of course, this is really deep in here, right? Because it's like the minimum of. Uh, I'm not going to go too far into this, so I just had to adjust that height value to get that closer to the surface. Um, so yeah, um, so I just because I messed around with some of the stuff that that messed up. Um, so uh, we're going to come over here to the emissive group. Um, one thing I'm going to call attention to is I'm using uh, a height to this, and it has some warps on it, right? So I'm just using a position node. Um, and actually, I don't think I need this stuff. Um, so let's go ahead and get rid of all this other stuff. So I'll take this, 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 and this. So it's essentially just a position node um, put into the fill, no a fill layer, and then I just use warp to kind of adjust it. Um, so that's a mask on a group. So inside this group, let's go ahead and delete this one. We'll take a look at this on the emissive channel. Um, we'll build this up, right? So the first thing I did was I did an emissive zero. Um, so this first emissive, I just, again, turned on emissive, just filled it with a color, and I just referenced my um, that pattern, uh, that pattern layer. Sorry, let me collapse these all down. I'm referencing this pattern anchor layer, this one right here. So uh, what I did is I just referenced it in. I filled it. Um, uh, and we're actually I'm referencing this pattern height layer, so I'm bringing this one, so I'm anchor pointing this and bringing that here. And then what I'm doing is to get this to be like so if, again, if I come out here, right, this is a little too you know blasting everything. So what I did is I just blurred it and then used levels to kind of shrink it in. And then I duplicated that layer and did the same thing for this one. On this one, I just made it a little bit fuzzier, right? So I just kind of, you can see I blurred and levels it just to kind of get that shape a little bit more organic, right? So I just, so that it could spill a little bit. Um, but you might not, you probably wouldn't have to do that if you didn't want to. That's the part I would, I'm iffy on. It kind of makes it feel a little too fuzzy. Um, and then I added a hot core just like I did on the other one, right? Which is just, again, like a brighter color. Um, same, same thing with an emissiveness. And again, I'm just taking my um, pattern and I'm blurring and then using levels to pull it in. And 
at this scale, I'm kind of having to work at a 4K texture set size, um, texture set settings inside my viewport, uh, or else this uh, would be really hard to, um, uh, this would all get really jumbly really quickly and messy and I couldn't see what I was doing. Um, and then in, on that whole group, I wanted to get kind of get some uh, variation to this. So um, what you could do is um, if I was to really, uh, if I had like full control over this, um, if there was an offset, random, 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 no. So, uh, you know, I could animate this technically, like in uh, Breath of the Wild, these kind of patterns have like a texture that moves through them. So let's go ahead and um, we'll, we'll leave it here. So on this position, right, um, you know, I could, uh, oops, let's go ahead and do boom, 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 top to bottom, right? So, you know, you could have things grow and change, right? So you could actually have it like move and change if you had this in an animatable program or a program that can animate. Um, or you could do something like a noise or another pattern where um, if I go to, let's try to do a fill, we'll just add a fill to this. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and let's get rid of that. Let's add a noise pattern. Do, 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 do. Um, so let's do something like, oh, I don't know, this one, right? Um, and they should have, uh, okay, so usually what they have is like an uh, evo evolution node, but if I did this in RenderMan, I could do this. Um, but essentially it would let me kind of like move and grow and change and animate the, uh, the texture. Um, so it feels like it's swimming across the surface. So anyways, um, I've just, that's just give it some more variation because without it, it kind of feels a little too flat and plain. And you know, it's nice to rotate your, um, your light to see what that looks like in shadow. Same thing with these ones over here, right? See what it looks like in darkness and shadow. So it's emitting light. All right, uh, I'm gonna show you guys this LED sign. This one's a little bit complicated um, and I won't go in the, into this one too much. But uh, on this one, what I did was I essentially added, oh, what is this one even? Oh, that's just roughness breakup. I should have named it roughness break. Okay, and let's just disable all these layers down to here. Um, so I have a couple screen or uh, anchor point layers down here, right? So I have two anchor point layers. The first one is just a pixel pattern. So I just made this pixel pattern and you can see I have two anchor points, like uh, essentially the version that's not blurred and the version that's slightly blurred, but it's very not noticeable, but it's essentially just a, uh, a circle pattern that I made. Um, and then under this one, I just grabbed again a shape from the shape node, a square one, and I just made an anchor point again on it. And so what I did was for the trim, right? So I made like a kind of a trim around it. And again, you can see that roughness is coming, coming through. That's where I would need to clean this up a bit. Um, let's see if, let's go ahead and add a roughness to that. There we go, eh, it kind of worked. Um, so on this one, what I did was I essentially grabbed my um, screen shape down here, right? So that, that um, square. And then what I did was I did this filter mask outline, right? So it gives me that, right? So here's our square, mask outline is just gonna do an outline for that. Um, and then right here, what I did is I added a fill node with a flat color value and set it to um, max. So that's just going to, uh, oh, sorry, min. It's going to take minimum. So it's going to look at both of these layers and compare which one has the minimum or smaller value and return that, right? So if I, and as I bring this down, you can see it's starting to flatten that layer out. So um, I'll just bring that down to here. And then I'm just going to reference that later on. So that's just trim height. And then for the material, right, I did the same thing where I'm just referencing this layer and I'm just setting a material properties of roughness and um, right here, roughness and color. So I can change color and I, metalness, right? If I wanted to be metallic, I could have done that. Um, it's not really what I would do, but yeah. So anyways, um, so now for the uh, LEDs, what I did is I've, this is, I'm just doing the emissiveness for it right now first. So on this layer, what I'm doing is I'm uh, taking um, my, uh, you know, my pixel pattern. And then I'm multiplying on top my screen to block everything but the screen. And then I brought in text. And again, I'm multiplying that out to erase everything but the text and just making an anchor point. So now um, when I look at this, you can see it's doing this emissive um, glow uh, on those circles. And I did the same thing again with that hotter core just to kind of get it to be a little bit more um, you know, natural feeling. One thing that doesn't make a lot of sense you'll see is like partial pixels or LEDs that doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but I'm not gonna, I don't think anybody's gonna notice or care at that distance. 
And this one's a little complicated. I'm probably not going to go into this one too much. Um, but I, what I did was I actually um, used a bit of a bump map. And so, so instead of doing height, what I did was, well, I did use height. You can see I brought in my anchor point layer for my, um, my pixel um, pattern. And I just actually fed that straight into height so that I could use this um, levels, or sorry, this filter to convert my height to normal. And the only reason why I did that was so that I could have this right here where I could have the screen that is not bumped, right? You can see that screen is like smooth and clean and it's not being affected by the layers below because what I did is I ended up using clear coat. So I use clear coat, um, color and roughness and opacity, right? So this is th what this layer looks like. And then I just turned on clear coat um, and clear coat is going to ignore um, or it's going to have its own bump in information, right? Um, or its own height channel, right? So um, it ignores the other height. But the only reason why I couldn't do this in height, right? If I change that from height to normal and I just used height instead. So let's go to height. I turned off my height. If I used height, you can see it's going to, oh, in this case, it's just going to be completely overridden by the one the one above it. Uh, if I set this to linear dodge add, right? You can see that's that now pushes through the surface. So um, that's why I kind of did this with, I changed my height and made it, fed it into the a normal channel so that it wouldn't be affecting the displacement as well. Because it's kind of a dumb setup, but my displacement is using my height channel. So I, I couldn't use that and get the clear coat to work correctly. So, I mean, that's really complicated. Don't worry about it too much. Um, but that's so I can get those LEDs and have a screen on top. And so that's the LED bump, right? So I can get those to feel, and I probably don't even need those. It, they're kind of nice, but I could have used like a color and roughness and it'd still kind of read pretty well. Um, but I just wanted to do that. And then I added a screen. So the screen, this is screen height, but it also has clear coat on it. So I'm also doing the clear coat roughness and color. In this case, color is just white. I don't even need that one. Um, and this one's just that screen. So it's just put, popping that screen off. So that's that pattern there. Um, and you know, the nice thing about doing all these anchor points and separating this out is I can come in here to this shape and I could, you know, scale it in the X and Y, right? And you can see it's, it's a updating its size um, and I can move it around, right? So I can offset things. Oh, so it's using warp projection, so I'd have to move it around. Um, so, you know, I can have a lot of flexibility there. Um, so that's just how I did that one. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the button. The button's pretty much covering all the same principles, um, but just slightly different. And this one's a little less cleaned up. So um, let me go ahead and pause this and clean up really quickly. Okay, so here we are. Um, we're gonna take a look at this. This is what this looks like. If we go through the different channels, we have um, height, emissive, normal, and base color. And you can see I've added a little bit of color, which I could have just switched it completely to um, emissiveness, but I wanted the outer shell to feel like it has a color. Um, so the way this one works is we're going to go ahead and build this up slowly. Let's go ahead and come over here. So I have my base material, of course, um, and then I have two anchor point layers as per usual. On this one, what I did was I went ahead and added a paraboloid shape. So it's just shape paraboloid. I just dropped it in from the um, the uh, library. Um, and then uh, this levels node is just shrinking it in a little bit because I was just I was playing around with the shape of it. And then I went ahead and made an anchor point. So this is going to be the anchor point for my um, base. And then I have I did a bevel on it. So you can see I added a bevel and then blurred it slightly. Um, and then that's going to be my button. So we have a base and a button. So let's go ahead and come up here to the indentation. The indentation is going to be using the base. So you can see I just grabbed the original circle because I, I would wanted this like to be like a, you'll see it here, right? Um, if we did indentation, I wanted like kind of like this inset around, you can see the whole mesh is moving, which is not a good sign, but you can see it, it pushes into the surface. So I have like this kind of indentation before I do the button, right? I kind of want it to feel like there's like a, um, you know, like a hole around the button. Um, instead, you know, if I didn't do that, then the button just comes straight off the surface. So that just helps it integrate a little bit better. Um, so on this indentation anchor, right, I'm just going ahead and pulling that original circle. I do that high pass again, I, instead of doing the high pass, I could have done the, um, uh, mask border, um, filter instead, and then just leveled it off. And then I created an anchor point. So on this actual, um, indentation layer, right, I'm just referencing that indentation, um, anchor point. 
right? So I'm just referencing the anchor point I made in there. And I just blurred it a little bit because it was a little too crunchy, right? So I just went like that right there. Okay. Um, and so then I came up here to the button. So for the button, I'm just literally grabbing the um, button anchor that I had added at the top, right? Which is just a beveled version of the circle, right? So it's that beveled version of the circle it has that bevel on it. So if I come up here and take a look at that, I just loading that in and adding a height to it. So I'm just adding height. I also changed the other materials. I could have separated that into a different layer, but in this case, I just made it really quickly. This was actually the first one I had made. Um, and so you can see, I just raised that button up. And something that's a little odd right here is I don't like that that goes right there and then it has this um, up and down. So I would have probably fixed that. But so if we come down here, if I had not used that blur and bevel, right? So if I just use the circle, it would push up again. It, um, when you use just a black and white image that has a hard fall off, it looks just like this, right? Where it just looks like a plateau, right? Like a, a shelf, right? Um, and then, but you know, and if we just blur it, right, then it gets like, and that doesn't look bad at all. But if I blur it, it usually just gets kind of soft and and lumpy right which sometimes works good for like organic stuff but in this case and you know if this would be would be on like a button on like a kid's toy right that would actually be really nice um, but in my case what i did was i wanted this to be um, beveled so it feels a little bit more you know like kind of um, uh, manufactured but you can see there's two things one is whenever you use bevel inside of substance painter um, it has like a pretty bad um, um, artifacting that it gets. Um, you can clean it up with some of the settings, but I usually just end up using a bit of a blur just to kind of clean that up. And if I needed to, I could use um, a sharpen to resharpen it back up if I wanted to. Um, so that's what I'm referencing in this button height layer. And so now let's get to the material. So this is my, I made a folder for the missiveness in the material because I wanted, you know, I'm, I essentially I set a uh, mask on that entire folder. So it's just referencing this button shape right here. And up close, you can see it kind of starts to fall apart and it doesn't look quite as good up close, but eh, it's good enough. Um, so let's go down here um, and I'm just going to build this up over time. So, you know, I have this material, so I'm just doing base color and roughness. Um, so I'm just giving it a slightly glossy look to feel more like a, a plastic button and just gave it a red color. Um, I added a little bit of roughness breakup, which is a little too AB, right? I should have a little bit more variation to it, but again, not really paying attention to it. Um, I added a little like spots to kind of like make the plastic feel like it has like it got scratched. I could have done scratches, but I kind of wanted to feel like the plastic was a little damaged. Um, and then I um, added a uh, glow anchor layer. In this case, it has some color. I, I could have just turned it off, but for the most part, um, I just have this mask here. And so this is a pretty complicated mask, but um, I, I think it gave me some really interesting shapes. So I built it up over time. So I just used the button. So I just grabbed the be um, buttons uh, anch anchor point. So I'm grabbing that anchor point that's down here, right? And I'm just loading it in. And I use the levels node to adjust the shape of it, right? And then I use the high pass filter to grab this edge. Um, and then I just blur sloped it to get it a little bit more organic. And then um, what I did is I added a paraboloid shape in there. I could have also just grabbed the original circle and messed around with it. I just blurred them together, did a little warp, and probably that's too much warp, and then I created a glow anchor. So this is really messy. This one's just like, I was just adding a bunch of shapes and playing around. Um, I could have done that a little, this was actually, I think, like the first or second um, one of these I had done um, for the example, so I would have done it a little bit differently. Um, and so, right, you can see that's just, uh, it has like a little bit of color, right? I just added a little color, but really the color is coming in in these emissiveness. So in each of these emissions, I'm just referencing that glow anchor and then just doing a little bit of blur and levels to control it, right? So um, I started really broad, so this is giving me like a really broad color glow. Um, and then I have one that's like a little bit s smaller, and this one's that one that I could probably get rid of and delete, to be honest. But again, it's just has a slightly different mask than this one. And they're just linear dodging, adding each other in the emissiveness. Um, so we'll come back out here. And this one gives me that like tight core. So my thought process on this one is it it's like a red um, shell piece of plastic and it has like a yellow or white LED underneath it. So you can see where it's hotter, it's like changing color. It's like looking, it's like looking more like the color of the LED light. Um, but then as it spreads, it starts to take on the color of the um, button itself. And so that one right there is just, you know, a hotter core down there. 
And then um, what I did here is I added a, a warp on all of my emissiveness. So you can see if I looked at my emissive channel, and I was playing with a lot of different ideas. You can see I kind of wobbled it and warped it because it felt a little too perfect for me. Um, and this is just a pass through layer and I'm just adding a warp filter to affect the emissive channel. So it's just affecting all the emissiveness. And yeah, that's pretty much it. So uh, I'll upload this file. So if anybody wants to take a look at it, um, uh, you can. Um, I know that kind of seems a little complex and convoluted in some cases, um, but if you can master or get used to some of these things, then you can do a lot of really cool tricks and um, add a lot of features into your um, objects, or especially your mechanical objects and your man-made art, art uh, manufactured ones, without having to do um, a lot of like modeling stuff. But you know, sometimes modeling, of course, makes it look better. Um, one thing I might do is I'm just going to add a fill layer really quickly, and it's going to be only affecting the normal. Um, so uh, actually, let's. I guess I would do this in a paint layer. So well, we could do it in multiple ways, right? Uh, I, I do want to call attention to a lot of these normal stamps, which are really nice. Um, they can be really helpful for just making cool panel lines and things like that. Um, what I'm going to do is let's take a look at just the normal channel. Um, and I like to, if I'm going to drop this in into a fill node and I want to move it around, um, what I like to do is switch this to 3D and 2D because on the 2D um, view, the UV view, is you can translate it and move it around, right? Um, so it gives you this really cool translate option, right? Um, so if I wanted to add this like pattern or this pa um, panel, I would just set this to UV and uh, UV wrap to set it to no repeating. Um, so if I come back out here, you can see we got this cool panel line for free, right? Very easy to work with, very, um, you know, no nonsense, no frills. If I come over here to normal, um, you can see we have this blending mode that's normal map detail. Um, what that does is it's kind of like the height using linear dodge add. Um, it just essentially adds on, um, you know, a uh, essentially adds a um, the detail to the normal my, uh, normal map information below. So if I have a bunch of normal doodads, so if I add another one and this one's only going to have normal, and I'll plug in a different shape into this one. So let's do this thing right here. Um, and then I'm going to do the same thing where we're going to go ahead and pull oops, pull it over to the chest, scale it down, and let's, let's just get, oh, there we go, move that out of the way. So I'll move it to right here, um, let's tile it a little bit, and then I'm just going to go ahead and set this to none. You can see they're combining together, right? They're interacting with each other. If I set this just to normal, though, it would override the one below it. Um, so just keep that in mind because you guys probably don't mess around with the normal channel quite as much. Um, so we'll just set that to normal map um, detail or combine. And then uh, if I wanted to dial back the intensity, I would just dial back the um, opacity of this layer, right? You wouldn't want to use any kind of filter like or levels node on this. Um, so just keep that in mind. Um, and so maybe I could put that one right up here. So that's kind of cool. So anyways, just keep in mind, um, these exist. Any of these ones that have that purpley color, that's what those are. Um, I can just swap those out. Um, you can download them. People upload a bunch of like alpha stamps that you're, well, you guys should download and play around with. And they're really easy to add some really quick detail to your model and make it feel a little bit more dimensional and have more modeled information for essentially for free. Um, so yeah, so that's something else you should take a look at.